100% of his brain given by the almighty Allah Taala. He is very brilliant, very convincing. I like it. He is a good speaker. That's the reason I am here again. He is very knowledgeable, very exciting. He enthuses. That's the great thing about him. I am actually very verbal opponent of uh, Islam. I have met him personally and we uh, discussed for three hours nearly. And I found his, uh, him a person of very uh, sharp mind. I thought that he won't be able to answer or he will be very jumbled. Whole of my idea went in vain. I appreciate his effort. Well, there is no comment for doctor. He is a very a great philosopher, excellent uh, person. His way of explaining the things are marvelous. Any layman can also understand him. Alhamdulillah Was salatu was salam Ala rasulillah Wa ala ali ashabi ajmain Amma baad A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Kul ya ahli al-kitab Ta'alaw ila qalmitin sawa'in Banyana binakum Alla na'buda illa Allah Wala nushrika bihi shayyum Wala yattakhitha baaduna baadun Arbaban min dunillah Fa intavallaw Fakul shadu Bianna muslimun رب شهلي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل الأقدة من لساني يفقه كولي My respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of Almighty God be on all of you the topic of this evening's talk is similarities between Hinduism and Islam. I started my talk by quoting a verse from the Glorious Quran from Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, which says, Kul Yahil al Kitab, say, O people of the book, Ta'alaw ila kalmatin sawa in bayna baynakum, come to comment terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah. That we worship none but one Almighty God. Wala nushrika bihi shayyam. That we associate no partners with Him. Wala yattakhiza baaduna baadan arbaban min dunillah. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fain tawallahu. 
if then they turn back fakulu shadu say e be witness be anna muslimun that we are muslims bowing our will to allah subhanahu wa taala this verse though it specifically refers to the ahli kitab to the jews and christians in general it can be used for people of different faiths and according to me it is the best verse that can be used while speaking with different kinds of people it says ta'alu ila qalmatin sawa' in bainana bainakum come to common terms as between us and you which is the first term allah na'budu illa allah that we worship none but one almighty god wala nushrika bihi shay'a that we associate no partners with him wala yattakhiza ba'duna ba'dan arbaban min dunillah that we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than one almighty god it is not appropriate to try and understand a particular religion by trying to observe the followers of that religion because many a times the followers they themselves are not aware about the teaching of their religion therefore the best and the most appropriate method of trying to understand any religion is to try to understand the authentic sources of that religion the authentic scriptures of that religion if you have to understand hinduism you have to try and understand the sacred scriptures of hinduism the most sacred are the vedas and the shlokas are recited from these scriptures that is supplemented by the upanishads by the itihas ramayana mahabharat bhagavad gita by the puranas manusmriti etc but the most sacred are the vedas amongst all the hindu scriptures so if you have to understand hinduism you have to try and understand the sacred scriptures of hinduism similarly in islam the most sacred scripture is the glorious quran which is the last and final revelation of allah subhanahu wa taala of almighty god which was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet muhammad peace be upon him it is supplemented with the authentic ahadith the sayings and the traditions of prophet muhammad peace be upon him so if you have to understand islam you have to try and understand the glorious quran and the authentic hadith of the prophet i would like to give the definitions of the word hinduism and islam let's understand the definition of the word hindu hindu is a geographical definition which refers to the people living beyond the river sindhu or the people living in the land watered by river indus according to historians this word hindu was first used by the persians when they came to india through the northwestern passes of himalaya it was also used by the arabs according to the encyclopedia of religion and ethics it is mentioned in volume number 6 reference number 699 that the word hindu is not found in any of the indian literatures or scriptures before the advent of the muslims to india and according to pandit jawaharlal nehru who wrote the book discovery of india on page number 74 and 75 he writes that the earliest occurrence of this word hindu can be traced to a tantric of 8th century ce means the first time the word hindu was used was in the 8th century in the christian era in a tantric in a scripture and it was used to describe the people it was never used for describing the followers of a particular religion its relationship to religion is of late occurrence the word hinduism is derived from the word hindu and it was first time used by the englishmen by the westerners by the britishers to describe a group of beliefs and faiths of the people of india according to the new encyclopedia britannica volume number 20 reference number 591 it says that the word hinduism was first used by the british writers in the year 1830 to describe the religion and the belief of the people of india since the word hinduism was first coined by the englishman it's a english word 
Today, the Hindu scholars they object and they say that Hinduism is a misnomer. The right word for the religion should be Sanatan Dharam, that is eternal religion or Vedic Dharam, that is the religion of the Vedas. And according to Swami Vivekananda, Hinduism is a misnomer. The followers should be called as Vedantist, that means the followers of the Vedas. So, in short, the word Hindu is a geographical definition used for describing the people of India. Its relationship to religion is of late occurrence. The word Hinduism was first used in 1830 by the British writers. It's an English word. And the word Sanatan Dharm, Vedic Dharm, and Vedantist is more appropriate, but these two are nowhere to be found in any Indian scriptures. All these words have come into existence in the past two centuries. Let's understand the definition of the word Islam. Islam comes from the word Salm, which means peace. It's also derived from Salm, which means to submit your will to Almighty God. Islam, in short, means peace obtained by submitting your will to Almighty God. And anyone who submits his will to Almighty God, he is called as a Muslim. And this word, Islam, occurs in various places in the Quran as well as the authentic hadith of Prophet Muhammad including the word Islam occurs in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2 verse number 2 and 8 and the word Muslim occurs in several places in the Quran the hadith including Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 64 there's a misconception that Islam is a new religion which came into existence 1400 years back and Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he was the founder of this religion of Islam in fact Islam is there since time immemorial since man set foot on this earth and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the founder of this religion, but he is the last and final messenger of Almighty God, to whom was revealed the last and final message, the glorious Quran, 1400 years back. In this talk of mine today, I will not be speaking about those similarities between Hinduism and Islam, which is commonly known by most of the followers of both of these religions. I will not be speaking about both the religions say that you should speak the truth, that you should not tell a lie, that you should not be cruel, that you should be kind, that you should not steal. All these are known by the followers of both these religions. In fact, I will be speaking about those similarities which are not known commonly by both the followers of these religions. First, we'll discuss the similarities between Hinduism and the pillars of Iman, of faith in Islam. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 177, Allah says that it is not righteousness that you turn your face to the east or west, but it is righteousness that you believe in Allah, you believe in the last day that you believe in his angels, his books and his messengers. There's a hadith which is mentioned in Sahih Muslim, word number one, in the book of Iman, chapter number two, hadith number six, a person approaches the Prophet and asks him, what is Iman? And the Prophet replies, Iman is believing in Allah, in God, in his angels, his books, his meeting, his messengers, in the resurrection, that's life after death, and in Qadr, that is destiny. So basically, there are six pillars of Iman in Islam. The first is believing in God. Second is believing in His angels. Third is believing in His books. Fourth is believing in His messengers. Fifth is believing in the resurrection, that is hereafter, that is life after death. And sixth is believing in Qadr, that is destiny. First, we'll discuss what Hinduism has to say about the first pillar, concept of God. If you ask a common Hindu 
that how many gods does he believe in? Some may say three, some may say ten, some may say hundred, some may say thousand, while others they say thirty-three crores, three hundred and thirty million. But if you ask this question to a learned Hindu who is well versed with the scriptures, he will tell you that the Hindus should actually believe and worship only one almighty God. But the common Hindu, he believes in a philosophy known as pantheism. The common Hindu believes that everything is God. The tree is God, the sun is God, the moon is God, the human being is God, the snake is God. What we Muslims believe that everything is God's, G-O-D with an apostrophe S. Everything belongs to God. The tree belongs to God, the sun belongs to God, the moon belongs to God, the human being belongs to God, the snake belongs to God. So the major difference between the Hindus and the Muslims is, the common Hindu says that everything is God, we Muslims say everything is God's, G-O-D with an apostrophe S. The major difference is the apostrophe S. If we can solve this difference of apostrophe S, the Hindus and the Muslims will be united. How do we do it? As the Quran says, Ta'alo ila kalmatin sawa'im barina bainakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That we believe in only one Almighty God. Let us try and understand what the Hindu scriptures have to say about Almighty God. It is mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad. Chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. It says, Ikkam ibidityam. It's a Sanskrit quotation, which means God is only one without a second. It is mentioned in the Shetash Vatar Upanishad. Chapter number 6, verse number 9. Nachasya kasij janita nachadipa. Of him, there are no parents. He has got no lords. Almighty God has got no mother. He has got no father. He has got no master. He has got no superior. It's mentioned in the Shetash Vatar Upanishad. Chapter number 4, verse number 19. Of him, there is no likeness. It's further mentioned in the Shetash Vatara Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 20, that his form cannot be seen. No one can see him with the eyes. Amongst all the Hindu scriptures, the most widely read and the most popular is the Bhagavad Gita. It's mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 7, verse number 20. All those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship demigods. Which means, all materialistic people, they worship demigods. That is the false gods besides the one true almighty God. It's further mentioned in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 10, verse number 3, that he who knows me as the unborn, the beginningless, the supreme lord of all the worlds. Amongst the Hindu scriptures, the most sacred are the Vedas. It's mentioned in the Yajur Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, Na Tassipati Ma Asti. Of him, there are no images. Almighty God has got no images. And further says that he is unborn, he alone should be worshipped. It's mentioned in the Yajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 8. That Almighty God is imageless and pure. It's mentioned in Yajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 9. Andhatma pravishanti ya asambhuti mupaste. Andhatma means darkness. Pravishanti means entering. And asambhuti means the natural things like fire, water, air. It means they are entering darkness, those who worship the natural things like fire, water, air and the verse continues they are entering more in darkness those who worship the created things like table, chair, idol etc. Who says that? Yajur Ved, chapter number 40, verse number 9. It's further mentioned in the Tharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 58, verse number 3 Dev Maha Asi, verily great is Almighty God and amongst the Hindu scriptures the most sacred are the Rig Ved. It is mentioned in Rig Ved. Book number 1, hymn number 164, verse number 46, the shloka which were recited by the respected pundits. It says, Ekkam Sat Vipra Bahuda Avadante. 
it comes at vipra bahuda vidante which means truth is one god is one sages call him by various names and the same message repeated in rigved book number 10 hymn number 114 verse number 5 that god is one but sages call him by a variety of names and in rigved alone in book number 2 him number 1 there are no less than 33 different attributes given to almighty god many of which were recited by the respected pundits one amongst them in rigved book number 2 him number 1 verse number 3 is brahma if you translate brahma into english it means the creator if you translate into arabic it means khaliq we muslims have got no objection if someone calls almighty god as khaliq or the creator or brahma but if someone says brahma is almighty god who has got four heads and on each head is a crown we muslims take strong exception to it moreover you are going against chetashvatar upanishad chapter number 4 verse number 19 which says na tasipati ma asti of him there is no likeness another attribute given in rigved book number 2 hymn number 1 verse number 3 is vishnu if you translate vishnu into english it means the sustainer it means the cherisher if you translate into arabic it is somewhat similar to rabb we muslims have got no objection if someone says almighty god is rabb or vishnu or sustainer or cherisher but if someone says Vishnu is almighty god who has got four hands one of his right hand is the disc is the chakra the other hand he has the conch he is traveling on the bird by the name of garuda or reclining on a couch of snakes we muslims take strong objection to it moreover we are going against yajurved chapter number 32 verse number 3 which says na tasipati ma asti of him there are no images if you read rigved all these description are not given the attributes are given that almighty god is creator he is sustainer he is cherisher we have no objection with attribute but these images are not given because it is mentioned in the vedas that almighty god has got no images it's further mentioned in rigved book number 8 hymn number 1 verse number 1 march the nadi sansad march the nadi sansad which means do not worship anyone except the one god it's mentioned in rigved book number 6 hymn number 45 verse number 16 ya ek it mushtihi praise him alone the one true god and the brahma sutra of the vedanta is ekam braham dyutya naste nehna naste kinchan which means bhagwan ek hi hai dusra nahi hai nahi hai nahi hai zara bhi nahi hai there is only one god not a second not at all not at all not in the least bit so if we read the hindu scriptures we understand the concept of god in hinduism next try and understand the concept of god in islam the best reply any muslim can give you regarding the concept of god in islam is quote to you surah ikhlas chapter number 112 verse number 1 to 4 which says qul huwa allah ahad say he is allah one and only allah us samad allah the absolute and eternal lam yalid wa lam yulad he begets not nor is begotten wa lam yakul lahu kufwan ahad and there is nothing like him this is a four line definition of almighty god given in the glorious quran in surah class which is the same as which was mentioned in the hindu scriptures the first is qul huwa allah ahad say he is allah one and only same as the chandogya upanishad chapter number 6 section number 2 verse number 1 which says ikam evidityam god is only one without a second the second was allah samad allah the absolute and eternal same as bhagavad gita chapter number 10 verse number 3 which says that he is the lord of all the worlds verse number 3 lam yalid wa lam yulad he begets not nor is begotten same as shetash patar upanishad chapter number 6 verse number 9 which says na chasya kasij janita na chadipa 
which means Almighty God has got no parents, He has got no lords, He has got no mother, He has got no father. And the last is, there's nothing like Him. Same as mentioned in the Shaitashvatar Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19, as well as the Ajurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, which says, Na tafsipati ma asti. Of Him, there is no likeness. He has got no images. The definition of Almighty God given in Quran and the Hindu scripture is exactly the same. This is the touchstone of theology. Surah Ikhlas and what's quoted from the Hindu scriptures is the touchstone of theology. If anyone says that so and so candidate is God, you put him to the test of Surah Ikhlas. If that candidate passes the test, he is the true Almighty God. If he doesn't, he is not a true God. For example, some people say that Bhagwan Rajnish, he is Almighty God. There was a Hindu brother of ours during question answer time once he said that if Hindus don't agree Bhagwan Rajnish is God. I know that. I never said that Hindus say Bhagwan Rajnish is God. I said some people say that Bhagwan Rajnish is God. I have read the Hindu scriptures. Nowhere do the Hindu scriptures say that Bhagwan Rajnish is God. But there are many people who have converted from different religions and now they say that Bhagwan Rajnish is God. Let us put Bhagwan Rajnish to the test of Surah class and the test of the Hindu scriptures. The first is, Pulhu Allah Wad, say it Allah and only, Ekkam Evidityam, there is only one God without a second. Is Rajnish one and only? Is he the only man who has claimed divinity? There are many who have claimed divinity, especially in this country of ours. There are thousands of men who have claimed divinity, he is not the only one. But the Rajnish Bhakti said, no, he is unique, he is the only one. Let's go to the next test. Allah Samad. Allah, the absolute and eternal. Was Rajnish absolute and eternal? We know from his biography that he was suffering from asthma, from diabetes, from chronic backache. Imagine Almighty God suffering from asthma, from diabetes, from chronic backache. Third test is Lam Yalid, Palam Yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. Same as Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. Na chasya kasij janita na chadipa. Of him, there are no parents, no mother, no father. We know Rajnish had a father and mother. He was born in the state of Madhya Pradesh. In 1981, he goes to America and takes thousands of Americans for a ride. And in the state of Oregon, he starts his town known as Rajnishpuram. Later on, the American government, they arrest him and they put him behind bars. And he claims that the American government gave me slow poisoning in the jail. Imagine Almighty God being slow poisoned. And later on in 1985, the American government, they kick him out of the country. He comes back to India and in the city of Pune, he restarts his center, which is today known as the Osho Commune. And if you go to Pune and visit the center of the Osho Commune, it is mentioned on his tombstone, Bhagwan Rajnish, Osho Rajnish, never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December 1931 to the 19th of January 1990. Never born, never died, but visited the earth from the 11th of December 1931 to the 19th of January 1990. Never born, never died. They forgot to mention on his tombstone that he was not given visas to 21 different countries of the world. Imagine Almighty God coming in this world to visit the world and he requires visas to visit different countries. And the Archbishop of Greece said, if you don't remove Rajnish out of this country, we will burn his house and the house of his disciples. And the last test, walam yakullahu kufwan ahad, there is nothing like him, is so stringent that no one besides the true Almighty God can pass. The moment you can compare God to anyone in this world, in this universe, he is not God. We know Rajnish, he was a human being like us, had two eyes, one nose, two hands, two legs, had a white beard. The moment you can compare God to anything in this world, he is not God. For example, if someone says that Almighty God is a thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger. You might have heard the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
the person who got the title Mr. Universe, Mr. World, the strongest man in the world, the strongest man in the universe. If someone says that Almighty God is thousand times stronger than Arnold Schwarzenegger, the moment you can compare God to anyone, whether it be Arnold Schwarzenegger, whether it be Dara Singh or whether it be King Kong, whether it be a thousand times or whether it be a million times, the moment you can compare God to anything in this world, He is not God. There is nothing like Him. My request is to my dear brothers and sisters, whichever God you are worshipping, put them to the test of Surya class and the test of the Hindu scriptures. If they pass the test, they are true Almighty God. If they fail, they are not. Otherwise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110, the ayat which was recited by the Qari, Qulidullah Abidur Rahman, Ayama Tadu, Falal Asma al Husna. Say, call upon him by Allah or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful name. You can call Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by any name, but it should be a beautiful name. It should not conjure up a mental picture. And there are no less than 99 different attributes given to Almighty God in the glorious Quran. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Hakim, most gracious, most merciful, most wise, no less than 99. And the crowning one is Allah. Why do we Muslims prefer calling Allah by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God? Because a person cannot play mischief with the Arabic word Allah as you can do with the English word God. For example, if you add S to God, it becomes God's, that's plural of God. There's nothing like plural Allah. Kul hu Allah ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. If you add D-E-S-S to God, it becomes Goddess, meaning a female God. There's nothing like male Allah or female Allah. Allah has got no gender. He is unique. If you add father to God, it becomes Godfather. He is my Godfather. He is my guardian. There is nothing like Allah Father or Allah by Islam. If you add mother to God, it becomes Godmother. There is nothing like Allah Ammi or Allah Mother in Islam. Allah is a unique word. If you add tin before God, it becomes tin God, meaning fake God. There is nothing like tin Allah in Islam. That is the reason we Muslims, we prefer calling Allah by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. But if there are some Muslims who while speaking with the non-Muslims about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these non-Muslims may not know the concept of Allah. So if they use the word God instead of Allah like how I am doing today, there is no problem. But I would like to remind that God is not the appropriate translation of the Arabic word Allah. And this word Allah is mentioned in all the sacred scriptures of the major world religion, including Hinduism. It's mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 2, hymn number 1, verse number 11. He's referred as Ilah, or Allah, meaning God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also mentioned by name in Rig Ved, book number 3, hymn number 30, verse number 10, as well as Rig Ved, Book number 9, hymn number 67, verse number 30. He has been mentioned by name as Allah in several verses of the Vedas. Let's try and understand the second pillar of Iman, that is the angels. As far as Hinduism is concerned, there is no particular concept of angels in Hinduism, but Hinduism, they have certain superhuman beings which do work which a normal human being can't do. In Islam, angels are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God. And they are created from light. They do not have a free will of their own. They obey all the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they have been appointed certain duties. For example, Archangel Gabriel, he has been appointed to get the revelations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the messengers of Almighty God. Let's discuss the third pillar of Iman, that is the books. First we'll discuss the books in Hinduism. The books in Hinduism are divided into two broad categories, the Shruti and the Smritis. The Shruti means something which is revealed, 
which is heard, which is perceived, which is understood. The Shrutis, by the Hindu scholars, they are considered to be of divine origin, to be the word of God. And they are the most superior. They are divided into the Vedas and the Upanishads. The word Veda is the these are the holy Vedas, the most sacred, and there are principally four Vedas. We have the Rig Veda, which deals with the songs of praises. We have the Yur Veda, which deals with the sacrifice formulas. We have the Sam Veda, which deals with melody. And the Atharva Ved, which deals with magical formulas. Vedas are the most authentic and the most sacred among the Hindu scriptures. And these Vedas, the exact date when they were written or when they were revealed is not known. According to Swami Dayanand Saraswati of Arya Samaj, he says that the Vedas are 1310 million years old. But according to the majority of the scholars, they say that the Vedas are approximately 4000 years old. The exact date is not known. To whom it was revealed or who compiled it is not known. Where it came into existence in the first time in the world it's not known. But yet, the Vedas are considered to be of divine origin, the word of God, and they are the most sacred amongst all the Hindu scriptures. Next we have, we have the Upanishads. There are more than 200 Upanishads, but our Indian culture puts a figure of approximately 108. And there are some important Upanishads, some say 10, some say 12, some say 18. This Upanishad, which is translated by Radha Krishna, he says there are 18 principal Upanishads. Next, we have the Smritis. Smriti means memory, that which is remembered. And these Smritis, they are less authentic, less sacred as compared to the Shrutis, the Vedas and Upanishads. And they are not of divine origin. The Hindu scholars say they have been written by men for the guidance of the human being how a life should be led. They are also referred as the Dharma Shastra. Among the Smriti, we have the Itihas, the epics. We have the two great epics, Ramayana and Mahabharata. Ramayana is an epic which deals with the story of Sri Ram, which most of us Indians, we are aware of it. Then we have the Mahabharata. Mahabharata talks about a feud between the cousins, the Pandavas and the Kauravas. It also deals with the story of Sri Krishna and all of us are aware about the story of Mahabharata. Then we have the Bhagavad Gita. It is an advice given by Sri Krishna to Arjun in the battlefield and it is a part of Mahabharata. It contains 18 chapters from the Bhishma Parva of Mahabharata from chapter number 25 to chapter number 42. It contains totally 18 chapters. Next, amongst the Hindu scriptures, we have the Puranas. We deal with the stories of deities, the creation of the universe. It is compiled into 18 voluminous parts by Maharishi Vyas. And most important amongst the Puranas is the Bhavishya Purana. This is the Bhavishya Purana, which talks about the future. There are various other scriptures of the Hindus, we cannot name all. Another one is the Manu Smriti, the laws of the Hindus, which are written by Manu. So in short, these are the scriptures, the books of Hinduism. But the major are the Vedas. If anything contradicts with the Vedas, the Vedas should be followed. They are the most sacred amongst all the Hindu scriptures and they are considered to be of divine origin. Let's discuss the books in Islam. 
It's mentioned in Surah Rath, chapter number 13, verse number 38. It says, وَلِكُلِّ أَجْلِنْ kitab." In every age have we sent a revelation. There were several revelations sent by Almighty God on this earth. But the last and final revelation is the glorious Quran. And it is the most sacred amongst all the Islamic scriptures. It was revealed to the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. 1400 years ago, it was revealed in Arabic. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Shuara, chapter number 26, verse number 196, that it is assuredly mentioned in the revealed books of the previous people. That means Quran is mentioned in the revealed books of all the previous people. The other sacred books are the authentic hadith, the traditions and the sayings of the last and final messenger prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. These are supplemented to the Quran. They are a commentary of the Quran. They will never conflict with the Quran. They will never overrule the Quran. This is Sahih Bukhari, which is one of the authentic books, the sayings of the Prophet. Fourth pillar of Iman is the messengers of God. First we'll discuss the messengers of God in Islam. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 24, there is not a people without a warner having lived amongst them in the past. Allah says in the Quran that there were several messengers sent on the face of the earth. He also says in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 40, Ma kana Muhammadun aba ahadim mir jalikum wa laakhi rasulullah wa khatam an nameen wa kana allahu bi kulli shayin alima which means Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the father of any of you men, but he is a messenger of Allah and he is the seal of the prophets. He is the last and the final messenger of Almighty God. And Allah is all-knowing, full of knowledge. Since Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was not sent only for the Muslims or only for the Arabs. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةَ لِلْعَالَمِينَ That we have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humanity, as a mercy to all the world, as a mercy to all creatures. The message is repeated in Surah Sabah, chapter number 34, verse number 28, where Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا كَفَّةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِرًا وَنَذِرًا That we have sent thee not but as a universal messenger, giving glad tidings, and warning them against sin. But most of the human beings yet do not know. And a prophet said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, point number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 56, hadith number 429, the prophet said, that all the previous messengers that came before me, they were only sent for their people. But I have been sent for the whole of humanity. Let's discuss the concept of messengers in Hinduism. The common Hindus, they have a different concept. They believe in avatar. The word avatar is derived from av, which means down, and tra, which means pass over. So avatar means to descend down, to come down. And according to Oxford Dictionary, it says that avatar means in Hindu mythology, a deity or a revered soul coming down on the earth in bodily form. The common Hindus, they believe that avatar means Almighty God coming on this earth as a human being. And this concept, they derive from Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 4, verse number 7 and 8, which says, Yada yada hi dharmasya Glanir bhavati bharata Abhyutra nam dharmasya Tatatma nam shrajya mayham It's a very common verse We hear it on the television In the serial of Mahabharat Which means that whenever There is decay of religion O Bharata And rise of unrighteousness 
I manifest myself. Verse number it says, to protect the good and for the destruction of the evil. And to establish righteousness. I will be born in every age. Some Bahwami Yuge Yuge. I will be born in every age. This message is also repeated in the Bhagavad Purana. Khan 9, Adhyay 24, Shloka 56. It says that whenever there is decay of righteousness and rise of sinfulness, I incarnate myself. But this concept of avatar, which most of the common Hindus believe in, it is nowhere to be found in the Vedas, the most sacred amongst all the Hindu scriptures. Therefore, the scholars of Veda, they say that the concept of avatar as believed by the common Hindu is different because avatar is a Sanskrit word which is possessive of Almighty God. It doesn't mean God Almighty has come himself down. It is possessive. Therefore, it refers to a man who Almighty God has sent. And if you read the Vedas, nowhere in the Vedas is the concept of avatar present. But the Vedas speak about saintly men, about rishis who Almighty God has sent to guide the humankind. This is exactly the same as the Islamic concept that Almighty God chooses a man amongst men and communicates with them on a higher level. And these men who Allah has sent to guide the human beings are called as messengers or prophets of Almighty God. So if you consider the Vedic concept, it is similar to the Islamic concept that Almighty God has sent chosen men who we call as prophets or messengers. Let's discuss what do the Hindu scriptures have to speak about the last and final prophet, the Antim Rishi. It's mentioned in the Bhavishya Purana, Parvatri, Khandatri, Adhyay 3, Shlokas 10 to 27. It says that the Malaychas have spoiled the land of the Arabs. There is the enemy who is causing mischief. I will send a man by the name of Muhammad to defeat these enemy and to guide the people. O oh Raja, you need not go to the foolish land of Pishachas. I, with my grace, will purify you here. A person of injured disposition comes to Raja and says, Arya Dharma will prevail in the world. The religion of truth will prevail in the world. I have been sent by Ishwar Paramatma and my followers will be those who will be circumcised, who will not have a shandy, a tail on the head. They will grow a beard. They will create a revolution. They will give the call for prayers. They will eat all lawful things but will not eat the flesh of swine. They will not be purified by herbs or shrubs but will be purified by warfare. They will be called Muslims. They will be a creed of meat eaters. Now this prophecy, if you analyze, refers to no one but the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It says that the enemies will be defeated by a man called as Muhammad. His name is mentioned, peace be upon him. And he will guide the people. And we know Prophet Muhammad led the Arabs from darkness to light. It further says that the followers of this prophet referring to the Muslims they will be people who are circumcised they will not have a tail on the head they will grow a beard they will create a revolution they will give the call for prayer that the azan they will eat all lawful things but will not eat the flesh of swine they will not be purified by herbs and shrubs but by warfare they will be called Muslims. they will be a community of meat eaters all these prophesize no one but Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and his followers the Muslims. Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him has been prophesied in several places in Bhavishya Purana. Time doesn't permit us to go into the details. I'll just give a reference of a couple. He's prophesied in Bhavishya Purana. Parva 3, Khanda 3, Adhe 3, Shlokas 5 to 8. He's also prophesied in Bhavishya Purana. Parva 3, Khand 1, Adhe 3, Shlokas 21 to 23. The Prophet Muhammad has even been prophesied in several places in the Atharva Ved. It's mentioned in Atharva Ved, book number 20, 
hymn number 127, shlokas 1 to 14. These are called as the Kuntup Suktas. Kuntup in Sanskrit means the hidden lands in the abdomen. Referring to the meaning of the shlokas are hidden, they will be known later on. Due to shortage of time, we'll just discuss the first four in brief. The first mantra says, He will be Narashansa. He will be Kaurama. He will be protected from 60,090 enemies. Mantra number two says, He will be a camel riding Rishi. Mantra number three says, He will be Mama Rishi. Mantra number four says, He is Vashvis Reb. The first mantra says, He is Narashansa. Narashansa in Sanskrit, it's derived from the word Nar, meaning a man or a person, and Shansa means praiseworthy. How we know in Hindi we say Prashansa? So Shansa is the same thing. So Narashansa means a person who is praiseworthy. And if you translate Muhammad, peace be upon him, from Arabic to English, it means the praiseworthy. So Narashansa is the Sanskrit translation of the Arabic word Muhammad, peace be upon him. The first mantra further says, He is Kaurama. One of the meaning of Kaurama, it means the Prince of Peace. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the Prince of Peace. The other meaning of Kaurama is an immigrant. And the Prophet migrated from Makkah to Medina. And the verse also says, He will defeat 60,090 enemies. And we know the population of Makkah. That was against Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was approximately sixty thousand. Mantra number two says he will be a camel riding rishi, indicating he will not be an Indian rishi, he will not be a Brahmin, because Manusmriti, chapter number eleven, verse number two hundred two says a Brahmin cannot ride a camel or an ass. So this means it cannot be Indian rishi, it cannot be a Brahmin, it has to be a foreign rishi, a foreigner. Mantra number three says he is Mama Rishi, also meaning Maharishi, means a great Rishi. Or some place that says Muhammad, that's the name of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi The fourth mantra says he is Reb. Reb means one who praises. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was also called as Ahmad, may peace be upon him, which means one who praises. And the Prophet was called the one who praises, which is the translation of the Sanskrit word. Rib. He has been prophesied in several other places in Atharva Ved. He is also prophesied in Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 6. It says that Akaru, meaning the praiseworthy man, he will defeat 10,000 enemies without a battle. This refers to the battle of Azab, battle of Khandak. Which Prophet Muhammad we know that he was the one who was praiseworthy. And he won the battle of Khandak, battle of Azab, in which the enemies were approximately 10,000 without the battle being fought. He is also prophesied in Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 21, verse number 7, saying that the Abandu, by God's help, will defeat 20 chiefs. Abandu means an orphan, it also means one who praises. Both of this refer to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he will defeat 20 chiefs. We know from history that approximately in Makkah, there were approximately 20 tribes. So Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he won the battle of Makkah and defeated all these 20 chiefs. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is even prophesied in Rig Ved, book number 1, hymn number 53. Verse number 9, the same prophecy, but the word is changed. It's called as Sushrama. And Sushrama again means one who praises. The translation of the word Muhammad. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is also prophesied in the Psalm Ved in Agni Mantra number 64. It says that he will not be fed by his mother. His mother will not breastfeed him. And after that, he'll become a prophet. And we know it was Arab custom that the children are normally breastfed by the wet nurse. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was breastfed by Halima. May Allah please with her. 
there are various prophecies of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in several places in the Vedas. He is also prophesied in some way in Uttarchik, mantra number 1500. It says that Ahmad will be given the eternal law. Ahmad, as I mentioned earlier, is another name for Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, meaning one who praises. He will be given the eternal law, referring to the Quran. Some way says he has been given the eternal law. But since Ahmad is a non-Sanskrit word, the translators could not understand what is the meaning of Ahmad. So they broke the word into Ah and Miti. And now they translate as I alone. So it means I alone have been given eternal law. So if we read the translation, it says, I alone have been given the eternal law, but actually it should read as Ahmad has been given the eternal law. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been prophesied as Ahmad in several places in the Vedas. He's also prophesied in the Vedas in some way in Indra, mantra number 152. He's prophesied in Yajurved, chapter number 31, verse number 18. He's prophesied in Rigved, book number 8. Hymn number 6, verse number 10. In Atharva Ved, book number 8, hymn number 5, verse number 16. In Atharva Ved, book number 20, hymn number 126, verse number 14. In several places, he has been prophesied as Ahmad, which was another name of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the one who praises. Furthermore, the last and final messenger has been prophesied as Nara Shangsa in several places in the Vedas. As I mentioned earlier, Nara Shangsa is derived from the word Nar, meaning a person or man, and Shangsa as Prashangsa means the praiseworthy. A man who is praiseworthy, which is exactly the translation of the Arabic word Muhammad. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has been prophesied as Nara Shangsa, as Muhammad, peace be upon him, in several places in the Vedas. He's prophesied in Rigved, book number one, hymn number 13, verse number three, in Rigved. Book number 1, hymn number 18, verse number 9. In Rigved, book number 1, hymn number 106, verse number 4. In Rigved, book number 1, hymn number 142, verse number 3. In Rigved, book number 2, hymn number 3, verse number 2. In Rigved, book number 5, hymn number 5, verse number 2. In Rigved, book number 7, hymn number 2, verse number 2. In Rigved, book number 10, hymn number 64, verse number 3. In Rigved, book number 10, hymn number 182, verse number 2. In Yajurved, chapter number 20, verse number 37. Yajurved, chapter number 20, verse number 57. Yajurved, chapter number 21, verse number 31. Yajurved, chapter number 21, verse number 55. Yajurved, chapter number 28, verse number 2. Yajurved, chapter number 28, verse number 19. Yajurved, chapter number 28, verse number 42. You can keep on quoting only references. He has been mentioned as Narashansa in several places in the Vedas. You can only give a talk for several hours together about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, mentioned in the Hindu scriptures. I'll just mention another one last prophecy. He has been prophesied as the Kalki Autar, the final Autar, the Antim Rishi. It's mentioned in the Puranas about the Kalki Autar, about his coming. It's mentioned in the Bhagavata Purana. Khan 12, Adhyay 2, Shlokas 18 to 20. It says that in the house of Vishnu Yash, the revered priest, Brahman priest, of the village of Sambhala will be born the Kalki Avatar. It further says that he will be Lord of the worlds and he will have unsurpassed qualities and character. He will be given specially eight criteria and he will be given by the angels a steed horse, a fleet horse and he will ride a white horse with the sword in his hand. He will defeat the miscreant the evil people and he will be savior to the world. It further says in Bhagavad Purana, Khan 1, Adhyay 3. Shloka 25 that in Kali Yuga where kings become robbers there will be a savior who will be born in the house of Vishnu Yash his name shall be Kalki he is even prophesied 
in the Kalki Purana, chapter number 2, verse number 4, that in the house of Vishnu Yash, the chief of the village of Sambhala will be born Kalki Avatar. Kalki Purana, chapter number 2, verse number 5, says that he will, along with four companions, defeat the evil people. Kalki Purana, chapter number 2, verse number 7 says that he will be helped by the angels in the battlefield. Kalki Purana, chapter number 2, verse number 11 says that in the house of Vishnu Yash, in the womb of Sumati, the Kalki Avatar will be born. And further says in Kalki Purana, chapter number 2, verse number 15, that he will be born on the 12th of the first half of the month of Madhav. Now all these prophecies refer to no one but the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Point number one, he will be born in the house of Vishnu Yash. That means his father's name will be Vishnu Yash. And we know that the name of the father of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was Abdullah. Vishnu Yash means the follower the obedient of Vishnu and Abdullah means the obedient the worshipper of Almighty God his mother's name will be Sumati Sumati in Sanskrit means one who is peaceful and the name of Prophet Muhammad mother was Amina which also means peaceful it says he will be born in the village by the name of Sambala. Sambala in Arabic means a place which is of peace and security. And we know Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was born in Makkah, which is also called as Darul Aman, which means a place of security and peace. It further says that he will be born in the house of the chief of Sambala. And we know Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born in the house of the chief of Makkah. It further says he will be born on the twelfth day of the first half of the month of Madhav and we know that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he was born on the twelfth of the first half of the month of Rabbi Awal it further says that the Kalki Avatar he will be an Antim Rishi the last Rishi and we know Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he was the last and final messenger of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala as is mentioned in Surah Ahzab chapter 33 verse number 40 it further says that he will receive guidance from Parshuram in the mountain and then he'll go towards the north and come back. We know he received the first guidance to Archangel Gabriel in Garahira in jabal nur that is the mountain of light. And later he migrated from Makkah, that is northwards, and he comes back to Makkah later. It further says that he will have qualities which are unsurpassed in character as Allah says in the Quran in chapter number 68 verse number 4 it says that verily thou art standing on the highest standard of character thou art standing on the highest standard of character it further says that this Kalki Avatar will be given 8 special qualities referring to he will be wise he will have self control he will have respectable lineage he will also have revealed knowledge. He will have valor and strength. He will have measured speech. He will have the qualities of being charitable. And he will also be very kind. All these eight criteria and characteristics refer to no one but the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It fits his character exactly. It further says, that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he will be given the steed horse by Shiva and we know Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was given the burak by Almighty God by which he went to Miraj the ascension to heaven it further says he will ride a white horse and will have the sword in the right hand we know that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he took part in most of the battles, most of which were in self-defense. He took active part, he even rode the horse and had the sword in the right hand. 
it further says that he will be a savior of humankind as Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fatir chapter number 35 verse number 24 and Surah Sabah chapter number 34 verse number 28 it says Wama arsalnaka, that we have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humankind and he has been sent as a guidance to the whole humankind but most of the men yet do not know he has also said that he will guide the people to the right path and we know Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa it was the days of Yom al Jahiliya, and he guided them from darkness to light. It further says that he will be supported by four companions who will spread the message. And we know the four companions mentioned refer to Hazrat Abu Bakr, Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Usman, and Hazrat Ali. May Allah be pleased with them all. And it further says that he will be helped by the angels in the battlefield. And we know in the battle of Badr. Angels help Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to win the battle. It's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse 123 and 125. It's also mentioned in chapter number 8, verse number 8 and 9. These prophecies undoubtedly refer to no one but the last and final messenger of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. He's been referred as the last Rishi, Antim Rishi, the last and final messenger of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Let's discuss the fifth pillar of Iman that is believing in life after death, believing in the year after. First we'll discuss life after death in Hinduism. The common Hindu, he believes in the cycle of birth, death and rebirth known as samsara, the theory of reincarnation. And this theory of reincarnation says that Almighty God has created different people in different ways. Some are born rich, some are born poor, some are born healthy, some are born with some congenital defect. So how could God be unjust in making different people born in different ways? So they came out with the theory of samsara, also known as theory of reincarnation or transmigration of soul. Based on the verse of Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 4, verse number 22, which says, whenever a person changes his clothes and wears new clothes, it is somewhat similar, like a soul gives away the body and enters new body. It believes in the theory of karma. The actions that you do are the karma. If you do good actions, you will be rewarded in this world or the year after. If you do bad actions, you will get a punishment. They also believe in the theory of dharma. Dharma means a person should live life according to the guidance of Almighty God. If you do good dharma, then your karma also will be good. And they believe in moksha. That means free from the cycle of birth, death and rebirth. If you analyze that this concept of transmigration of soul or samsara, is no way mentioned in the Vedas. What the Vedas speak is about the Punar Janam. Punar means next or again. Janam means life. So Punar Janam means next life or life again. It doesn't mean life, death and life again. It's not cycle of birth, death and rebirth. It's only next life or life again. So the Hindu scholars who believe in the Vedas, they say that the concept of transmigration of soul was never mentioned in the Vedas. It came into existence later on. What is mentioned in the Vedas, if you read Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 16, verse number 4 and 5, it speaks about the next life and also says you will go to paradise, but doesn't speak about death, life and death. Further, if you analyze the Vedas, and the other Hindu scriptures, they talk about swarg, about heaven, and describe heaven that it is a very beautiful place where rivers will flow, there will be rivers flowing of milk, and there will be various fruits, it will be a place which is good. It even talks in several places in the Vedas, in Atharva Ved, in Rig Ved. The Vedas even speak about Nark, that is hell. The description is somewhat like fire. And it says that this fire of hell will be bad. 
and a person won't be able to bear the pain in hell. So the concept of hell and heaven is there. But the concept of death, birth and death is not there anywhere in the Vedas. Because the human beings, the scholars, they could not know how could some people be born healthy, some people born with congenital defect. So because of this, we find that this concept have come about the birth, death and rebirth. Let's discuss life after death in Islam. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 28. Don't you know that you were dead and he gave you life and then caused you to die and then we again resurrected you? Your resurrection, by Allah mentioned in the Quran, is you come in this world only once. And again you're resurrected. And Allah says in the Quran, in chapter 67, verse number 2, that It is Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good indeed. This life is a test for the hereafter. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 185, Allah says that Kullu nafsin zaikat al-maud Every soul shall have a taste of death. The final recompense is on the day of judgment. And those who save from the hellfire and get guarded in the life, they will achieve the objectives of this world. For this world is nothing but mere amusement and chattels of deception. The description of heaven is given in the Quran. It describes that there are many rivers in the heaven. There are rivers of milk and there will be various fruits. It is a very beautiful place. And Quran also describes about the hellfire. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 24, about the description of hell. And if we analyze in the Quran, as compared to Hinduism, it doesn't have a philosophy that life, death and life again. Because some people are born rich, some people are born poor, some people are born with health, some people with congenital defect. Allah says that this life, different people have different tests. And depending upon different tests, the life will keep on changing. Let's discuss the sixth pillar of Islam. The sixth pillar of Islam is destiny. It's Qadr. And Allah says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has certain things destined. For example, when a person is born, where will he die? When will he be born? How will he live? Like how the questions in the examination, it keeps on changing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already destined how will a person be born, how will he die? And this concept is the same even in the Hindu scriptures that Almighty God has destined, He has assigned how will a human being live. This was in short the similarities between the six pillars of Iman and Hinduism. Let us discuss the various similarities between Islam and Hinduism. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 19. Allah says, Ya Allah Amanu, O you believe, in Namal Khamru al Maisuru, most certainly intoxicants gambling, while Anzabul Aslamu, dedication of stone, divination of arrows, rich summary in Shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. First then will Allah come to Flihun, abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Allah says that intoxicant, gambling, divination of arrows, all these are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. Let's analyze what do the Hindu scriptures have to say about these things. If you read, it's mentioned in Manusmriti, chapter number 9, verse number 235. It says that a person who is a priest killer, who is a liquor drinker, and who is a person who lies on the marriage bed of the Guru, and who is a thief, all of them do major sins. And in Manusmiti, chapter number 9, verse number 238, it says that all of these should be punished. And it says that these people, no one should talk to them, no one should sacrifice for them, no one should marry them, and all of these people should leave all the religion and should wander in the world. They should be excommunicated. That means anyone who has intoxicants, according to Manusmiti, 
they should wander in the world and they should be excommunicated from all the religions. It is more strict than Islam. And if you read the Hindu scriptures, intoxicants had been prohibited in several places. If you read Manusmriti, chapter number 11, verse number 55, it says that a person who drinks and a person who kills the priest, who steals and who sleeps on the marriage bed of the Guru, all of them, all those who associate with them, all of them are major sinners. It's further mentioned that alcohol has been prohibited in Hindu scriptures in several places, including Manusmriti, chapter number 7, verse number 47, Manusmriti, chapter number 7, verse number 50, in Manusmriti, chapter number 9, verse number 225, in Rig Ved, book number 8, hymn number 2, verse number 12, in Rig Ved, book number 8, hymn number 21, verse number 4. In several places, the Hindu scriptures, they prohibit the having of intoxicants. Even gambling has been prohibited in Hindu scriptures. In Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 34, verse number 3, it says that a person who gambles, his wife, he is left aloof. And his mother, they hate the gambler. And no one supports him. It's further mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 34, verse number 13 it says that do not play with the dice rather you should do farming if you do farming even if you earn less money it will be good for the hereafter if you analyze the Hindu scriptures they forbid for a person to gamble it's mentioned in Manusmriti chapter number 7 verse number 50 it says that a person who drinks the person who gambles a person who indulges with women and hunting, all of them, they are the most four major crimes that a person can do. Gambling has been prohibited in several places. In Manusmriti, chapter number 7, verse 47. In Manusmriti, chapter number 9, verse number 221 to 228. It's also mentioned in Manusmriti, chapter number 9, verse number 258. The Hindu scriptures also prohibit fortune telling. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90. Ya Lazin Amanu, O you believe, in the Malkhamru al Maisuru, most certainly intoxicated and gambling, while Anzabu al Aslamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, Rishtum and Amni Shaitan, these are Satan's handiwork. First handiwork, Allah comes to Flihun. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Gambling has been prohibited. Besides gambling and alcohol, even fortune telling has been prohibited. It's also private in Manusmriti, chapter number 9, verse number 258, that all those who do fortune telling, they are doing a sin. And verse number 262 says that king should punish them according to the severity of their crime. Allah also says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 188, Allah says, Use not your wealth as a bait for judges, in order you may eat other people's wealth. Bribing has been prohibited in the Quran. Even the Hindu scriptures in Manusmriti, chapter number 9, verse number 258, that all those who bribe, all those who deal in fraud, all of them are major sinners. And the punishment is mentioned in Manusmriti, chapter number 9, verse 262, that the king will punish them depending upon the severity of the crime. Furthermore, Islam believes in polygamy. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 3, Allah says that marry women of a choice in twos, threes or fours but if you can't do justice marry only one. Quran is the only religious book which says marry only one. There is no other religious scripture on the face of the earth which says marry only one. All the other major religious scripture if you read no religious scripture says marry only one. If you read the Hindu scriptures if you read Raman it says that King Dashrat the father of Ram he had more than one wife it's mentioned in Vishnu Sutra, chapter number 24, verse number 1, that a Brahmin can have four wives. If you read Mahabharat, Krishna, how many wives did he have? Krishna had 16,108 wives. So if Krishna can have 16,108 wives, so why can't we Muslims have up to four? If you analyze, the Hindu scriptures say, a Hindu can marry as many wives as they want. It is the Indian government which has put up limitations. The Indian government has passed a law in 1956 called as the Hindu Marriage Act. 
and says that a Hindu can only marry one wife. But the Hindu scriptures say that the Hindus can marry as many wives as they want. There's no upper limit. But the Indian government has put up a limit that they can only marry one. If you read the report of the Indian government of the status of women, it's mentioned on page number 66 and 67. It gives the statistics of the polygamous marriages done in a span of 10 years from 1951 to 1961. And the Muslims have done 4.31% of polygamous marriages. And the Hindus have done 5.06% polygamous marriages. The reason for polygamy has been mentioned in my cassette on women's rights in Islam. This was in brief regarding the similarities between Hinduism and Islam. You can keep on talking for us together and for the complete day. But if you analyze, because of the British rule, we find that Hinduism has gone down. And especially the Britishers, they came to India to do business and they changed many of the religious beliefs of the Hindus. That's the reason late towards the 18th century and 19th century, there was a surge of Hindu reformers. And the pioneer among the Hindu reformers was the person by the name Raja Ram Mohan Roy. Raja Ram Mohan Roy, he was from Bengal and he was born in 1772. And he preached that you should believe only in one God, should not do idol worship. He was against the caste system and he wrote a book in 1803. He learned Persian, English as well as Arabic. And in that book, he condemned idol worship. He said he does not even agree in the avatar. And he started a new trust by the name of Brahma Samaj. And this Brahma Samaj, in the trust deed, he writes that no sculpture, no graven image, no picture, no painting, no photograph should enter the building. And later on, there were many offshoots of the Brahma Samaj. And all of them, they had the common teachings that Almighty God is one. He has got no images. There are no ideas of Almighty God. Almighty God has got no avatar. They were against idol worship. And regarding believing in the cycle of birth, death and rebirth, this was optional. If you want, you can believe. If you don't want, you don't believe. The other great reformer, which was offshoot of Brahma Samaj, was Justice Ranade. Justice Ranade, he was the person who started the Pratna Samaj. I hope you are aware of Pratna Samaj. Are you aware of Pratna Samaj? Very good, you are aware of Pratna Samaj. How many of you know about Justice Ranade? How many of us? This person, he started an offshoot of Brahma Samaj and he even preached against caste system. He even preached that the widows, the women, they should remarry. He even preached that the women should be educated. The other great reformer among the Hindu was Swami Dayanand Saraswati. He started in 1875 the Arya Samaj and the three Pandits, they are from Arya Samaj. What he said? That we should strictly follow the Vedas and we should not follow anything but the Vedas. Believe in one God, that we should not do idol worship, should not believe that God has got avatar. He started the Arya Samaj. We even have one more famous reformer by the name of Swami Vivekananda. He was the founder of Sri Ramakrishna Mission. And he said that Hinduism is a misnomer. We should call the followers as Vedantist. And he made Hinduism come into the Western world where he gave a talk in Chicago in the Parliament of Religion. We find that many Hindu reformers were there. They tried to improve the teachings of Hinduism. And today we come to know from history that the Britishers they had come to India to do business. They came to India about a few centuries back. They came for doing business, but they looted our country. They even ruled our country. And these Britishers, they changed the religious belief of the Indians. And these people, 
they saw to it that they changed the philosophy of Hinduism. So we find a surge of Hindu reformers, especially in the late 18th century and the 19th century. For example, as I mentioned, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, example of Vivekananda, example of Swami Dhyan and Saraswati, Justice Anade, and these people, they were reformers. And people may wonder that all these things that I mentioned in my talk about the facts of Hinduism that I mentioned, they weren't concoction. But I received all these guidance about Hinduism from these great reformers like Raja Ram Mohan Roy and Justice Anade. And after I read this book, these people are great scholars. I am just a student of comparative religion. I am not a scholar. When I read the books of these scholars, I being a student of comparative religion, I don't take anything for granted. Whatever they said, I checked up whether are they available in the sacred scripture of the Hindus. And after verifying them, I have mentioned the facts of Hinduism while quoting the references of the Hindu scriptures. And all the facts I mentioned about Hinduism, I have also mentioned the references from the Vedas as well as the other scriptures like Upanishads, like Bhagavad Gita, etc. Those Hindus who strictly believe in the Vedas, they don't believe in any other scripture of Hinduism. So even if you remove all the other references of the Hindu scriptures, whatever references I have given, I have quoted the Vedas as well as the other scriptures. If you remove the references of the other scriptures, yet the message of Hinduism is the same. There are other Hindus, though they believe that Veda is the most sacred among the Hindu scriptures, but they even believe in the other scriptures and they more commonly read Bhagavad Gita, etc. That's the reason I have even quoted the Vedas, even the other Hindu scriptures. I have been enlightened by the great reformers of Hinduism and from history we have come to know that the Britishers they ruled India by having a philosophy of divide and rule with this philosophy they ruled India for several years we alhamdulillah more than 50 years back we have got the freedom of this country from the rule of the British but unfortunately, we yet continue following the philosophy of the Britishers of divide and rule. And we have examples that most of the Indian politicians, they follow the philosophy of the Britishers and they have the philosophy of divide and rule for the vote banks. And we find that in this country of ours, the maximum rights in any country of the world, it's in India. And the cause that these politicians, they instigate these rights. They follow the philosophy of divide and rule. And many people say that the politicians, they add fuel to the fire. I disagree. The politicians of India, they don't add fuel to the fire. These people, they add fire to the fuel. We know that the fuel is used for constructive work, for vehicles, for factories, for upliftment of India. But these people, they add fire to the fuel and they cause the destruction of India. All the politicians aren't like that. But most of them, they add fire to the fuel and they use it as a vote bank. Most of them, if not all, irrespective whether they are Hindu politicians, Muslim politicians or Christian politicians. And there was an article which came in the Times of India a few weeks back. It said that according to Japan, according to Japan, in the next 20 years, India will be a superpower. And it's my humble request to my dear Hindu brothers, to my dear Muslim brothers, to my dear politicians of this great country of India, it's my humble request that you people, you should understand, you should follow the sacred scriptures, 
go back to the sacred scriptures of Hinduism and of Islam and if we follow our sacred scriptures inshallah God willing in the next 20 years India will be a superpower <laughs> India will be better than America and the European countries it's clearly mentioned it's clearly mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 10 hymn number 71 verse number 4 it's mentioned that seeing the word you see not Hearing the word you hear not. You hear the word of Almighty God, but you hear not. You see the word of Almighty God, but you see not. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 44. Allah says that you read the scriptures, but why don't you follow it? Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 18. Summum, bukmun, umyun, firmna arjun. The deaf, the dumb, the blind, they will never do the true part. And we find that the religious personalities of most of the major religions they prevent the followers from reading the scriptures the religious leaders whether they be Hindus Muslims or Christians they prevent the followers of the religion to read the scripture with understanding and I have given a talk on Al-Quran should it be read with understanding and I proved there that the Quran was revealed so that a person should understand the revelation of Almighty God and follow the commandments of Almighty God. The best is to understand Arabic as a language. If you can't understand Arabic as a language, read the translation of the Quran in the language you understand the best. And today we find that even though there are various sects in the religion of Islam, there are minor differences but the major principles of the various sects in Islam it is the same all the various different sects of Islam they believe that there is one God they believe that the Quran is the last and final revelation of God they believe in the last and final messenger it is the same there may be minor differences but the major pillars are the same and if we analyze the reason that even though Islam has been divided into different sects the major teachings are the same because Quran was revealed in Arabic and Arabic is a living language there are several hundreds of millions of people who know Arabic as language because of this because the Quran was revealed in Arabic no one can change the main teachings of Quran a great critic of Islam Sir William Moore he says though he is a critic of Islam he says that Quran is the only book which has remained pure for 12 centuries he mentioned this 200 years back and today Quran is a book which has remained pure for 14 centuries <laughs> if you go back to the scriptures you understand if you follow the main scriptures if you understand Arabic or understand the language which you understand the best the principles are the same it's my humble request to the Indian government it's my humble request to my Hindu brothers that you should revive Sanskrit the Indian government and my Hindu brothers they should revive the Sanskrit language today Sanskrit is a dead language you should revive the Sanskrit language and understand the scripture of Hinduism if you understand the scripture of Hinduism you will realize that your scripture and the Islamic scripture they speak about the same one God they believe in the same message and the last final message the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him they believe about the resurrection about life after death I would like to end my talk with the verse of the glorious Quran of Surah Yunus chapter number 10 verse number 108 which says Kul ya yuwan nas Kat jaakamul haqqum ir rabbikum Say O oh humankind Truth has arrived from the Lord Those who receive guidance They are on the straight path And those who go astray They will be on the wrong path And I have not been set To manage your affairs Wa akhir dawan alhamdulillah rabbil alameen
I am Mrs. Rangwala. You have praised Raja Ram Mohan Roy in your talk. Do you know that he was against parda? Why does Islam degrade women by keeping her behind the veil? Isn't a Hindu woman modest in her shalwar kameez? The sister asked a very good question that I spoke highly about Raja Ram Mohan Roy in my talk and about the reform he brought in Hinduism. But he even spoke against the hijab system that's there in Islam. So do I know about that? And why does Islam degrade the woman by keeping her behind the veil? And is a Hindu woman who does not wear a veil and wear a salwar kameez, is she modest? Sister, you should understand that if I appreciate certain points of a person, that does not mean I agree with all his points. For example, four years back, four years back, the Home Minister of India, Mr. L.K. Adwani, he suggested the law that the rapist should be put to death. And I appreciated that he agreed with the Islamic philosophy that the rapist should be put to death. But when I appreciated Mr. L.K. Adwani, that doesn't mean I agree with him totally. But I do agree with the suggestion that a rapist should be put to death, same as Islam says. Similarly, Raja Ram Mohan Roy, I appreciate him. He is a great reformer. I really respect him. I also know that he was against the hijab system, which is mentioned in Islam. Now today if we analyze the modesty level of a human being, it differs depending upon the surrounding they live in. For example, there are certain Muslim countries in the Arab land who say that if anyone looks at a woman or stares at a woman, it is considered immodest. Anyone stares at a woman, it is immodest. In India, as long as you don't touch a woman, you are modest. Therefore, while they greet the ladies and the gents, they fold their hands, but they don't touch anyone. If you don't touch a woman, you are modest. In some of the Western countries, shaking hands is modest. If a man shakes hands with a lady, it is modest. And if you don't shake hands, it is considered that you are not friendly. In other Western countries, if you kiss a woman, that is modesty. If you go beyond kissing, it is immodest. Some Western countries, as long as the men and the lady, anything they do, as long as they do willingly, it is modest. So different people have different levels of modesty depending upon where they live. For example, in America, if a lady wears a mini skirt or shorts, she is considered modest. But the same girl, if she comes to India and she wears a mini skirts and shorts, we will say she is immodest. When I gave a talk in America, there was an American who told me, Brother Zakir, do you know the Indian women are immodest? I was shocked. I didn't agree with him. He said, of course, the Indian women, when they wear the sari, they expose their belly. So according to the Americans, exposing the belly is immodest. So depending upon different people, the level of modesty keeps on changing. Let us try and analyze what does our Creator, Almighty God, have to speak about modesty. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, Say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Allah first speaks about the modesty for the man and then of the woman. Whenever a man looks at a woman, any breath and thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. There was a Muslim who was staring at a girl for a long time. I told brother, what are you doing? It is haram to stare at a woman. He told me, our beloved prophet said, the first glance is allowed, the second is prohibited. I have not yet completed half my glance. <laughs> what did the prophet mean when he said the first glance is allowed, the second is prohibited? What he meant was, if you unintentionally look at a woman, do not intentionally look at her to feast on her beauty. That doesn't mean you can look at a woman for 10 minutes without blinking and saying, I have not completed my glance. The next verse speaks about the hijab for the woman. Allah says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, Say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty, and display not her beauty except what appears ordinary of, and draw her veil, a head covering over the bosom, except in front of her father, 
her husband, her sons, and the big list of marams who she cannot marry is given. And the criteria for hijab is given in the Quran, the Sahih Hadith. There are basically six criteria. The first is the extent. That is, the extent for the man is from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen is the face and the hands up to the wrist. The remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman. The second criteria is the clothes they wear, it should not be transparent so that you could see through. The third is it should not be tight fitting so that it reveals the figure. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous so that it attacks the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And sixth, it should not be clothes which are signs of the unbelievers. And the reason for hijab is given in Surah Azab chapter 33 verse 59 in which Allah says, O Prophet, tell to your wives and your daughters and the believing women that whenever they go abroad, they should put on a cloak so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. Suppose there are two twin sisters who are very beautiful, who are equally beautiful and if they are walking down the streets of Bombay, down the streets of Pedro and one of the twin sisters, she is wearing the western clothes, a mini skirt and short. And the other twin sister, she is wearing the Islamic hijab, complete body covered, except the face and the hands up to the rest. And if they are walking down the streets of Pedder Road, and if round the corner there is a hooligan, there is a ruffian who is waiting for a catch, who is very to tease a girl. I am asking you a question, which girl will it tease? Will it tease the girl wearing the mini skirts or short, or will it tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab? But naturally, he will tease the girl wearing the western clothes. Let's analyze what do the Hindu scriptures have to speak about modesty. It is mentioned in Rig Ved, book number 8, hymn number 33, verse number 19. It says that when Brahma has made you a dame, when Brahma has made you a woman, you should lower your gaze and should not look up. You should put your feet together and you should not reveal that which the garment and the veil conceals. So Rigve says that the woman should wear the veil. They should lower their gaze and should not stare. It's further mentioned in Rigve, book number 10, hymn number 85, verse number 30. It says, unlovely is the person, is the husband who covers his thighs with the garment of the wife. So Rigve says that wearing the clothes of the opposite sex is prohibited. It's further mentioned in Mahavir Charit, Act 2, page number 71 that Rama says when Parusharam comes Rama tells his wife Sita that he is our elder please lower your gaze and put on the veil Rama tells his wife Sita put on the veil and lower your gaze if you read historical books the books talking about the coin age of the age of Gupta and post Gupta age there are coins which have women wearing veil Indian women up and the veil goes up to the shoulders some go up to the arms many Indian women if you go to the villages they wear the veil they cover the head some of the women even cover their face so if we analyze even the Hindu scriptures say that the woman should wear the veil that the woman should lower the gaze it's a pity that Raja Ram Mohan Roy he might not have read these verses God willing, if Raja Ram Mohan Roy would have read these verses, even he would have told that the woman should wear the veil. Four years back, I appreciated the Home Minister Elke Advani for suggesting that the rapist should put to death. Maybe the next Home Minister, he would advise that the woman of India should wear the veil. Yes, brother. Can you state your name and profession? Assalamu alaikum. Yes. My name is Afroz Vasaya. I am a manager in a private limited company. I would like to put one question. It is a common belief of all the religion that uh, God can do everything. Then why can't he become human being? The brothers posed the question that all the religions believe that God can do anything and everything. So why can't he become a human being? Most of the religions besides Islam they believe in a philosophy known as anthropomorphism that an almighty God he takes human forms and they believe in the philosophy that almighty God is so holy he doesn't know the shortcomings of the human being how will the human being feel when he's hurt how will the human being feel when he's in trouble or in problem so almighty God has come down in this world and become a human being to set the rules for the human being on the face of it it's a very good logic but I tell these people that suppose 
I manufacture a VCR. Do I have to become a VCR to know what is good or what is bad for the VCR? Since I'm the creator, I don't have to become a VCR. I just write an instruction manual that if you want to play the VCR video cassette recorder, put in the video cassette and press the play button. If you want to fast forward, press the FF button. If you want to stop, press the stop button. Don't drop it from a height, it will get spoiled. Don't immerse it in water, it will get damaged. I'll write an instruction manual. Similarly, Almighty God, since He is the creator of the human beings, He does not have to become a human being to know what is good or what is bad for the human being. What does He do? He chooses a man amongst men. And He reveals the revelation. And the last and final revelation for the human beings, it is the glorious Quran. The do's and don'ts. If I agree with you for sake of argument that Almighty God can do anything and everything, so why can't He become a human being? If I agree with you for sake of argument that God can do anything and everything, that He can even become a human being, if God becomes a human being, He ceases to be God. Because God and human beings have got different qualities. Almighty God, He is immortal. Human beings are mortal. You can't have a person who is immortal and mortal at the same time. God has got no beginning. Human beings have a beginning. You can't have a person who has a beginning and no beginning at the same time. Almighty God has got no end. Human beings have an end. You can't have a person who has an end and no end at the same time. It's meaningless. So either you can have God or you can have man. You can't have a God man. It doesn't make sense. Human beings, we require to eat. Almighty God does not require to eat. Allah says in Surah Anam chapter 6 verse number 14, Almighty God feeds everyone but does not require to be fed. We human beings require rest and sleep. Almighty God does not require rest. If I agree with you for sake of argument, Almighty God can do anything and everything. In that same argument, Almighty God can even tell a lie. It is ungodly to tell a lie. The moment God tells a lie, it is to be God. If I agree with you, God can do everything. God Almighty can even be unjust. But the moment God does injustice, he ceases to be God. Allah says in the Quran, Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse 40, that Almighty God is never unjust in the least degree. If Almighty God wants, he can forget. But to forget is ungodly. Allah says in Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse 52, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never forgets. The moment Almighty God forgets, he ceases to be God. If Almighty God wants, he can make a mistake. But to make a mistake is ungodly. Allah says in Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse 52, that Almighty God never makes a mistake. The moment God makes a mistake, it's easy to be God. Nowhere in the Quran it is mentioned that God can do everything. What Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fatir, chapter 35, verse number 1, is, Inna Allah la kulli shayin qadir. That verily, Allah has power over all things. It's mentioned in several places. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 106. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 109. In Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 284. In Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse 29. In Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 77. In Surah Fatir, chapter 35, verse number 1, Allah says, Inna Allah la kulli shayin qadir. For verily, Allah has power over all things. Allah says in Surah Buruj, chapter number 85, verse number 16, that Allah is the doer of all he intends. Whatever he intends, he can do. But Almighty God will never intend telling a lie, will never intend making a mistake, he will never intend becoming a human being, he will only intend things which are godly. Hope that answers the question. Next question from the brother on my left. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Atif Sumar, I am a student, and my question is that Hindu scholars. Well, when they're doing idol worship, they claim that they're just worshipping the Almighty God, but the idols are just for concentration. So, according to Islam, is it allowed? Is this allowed? The brother asked the question that the Hindu scholars, they agree that idol worship is wrong. But, to concentrate on Almighty God, the idol is only used for concentration. They agree God has got no images, but they use for concentration. So, is it right? All these Hindu scholars, they have read the Hindu scriptures and the scholars agree that Almighty God has got no images. But what they say that those people who have lower consciousness, they require an idol for concentration. Once you reach a higher level of consciousness, then idol is not required. So I tell these pundits and scholars that those people who have higher consciousness, they don't require an idol to concentrate. So we Muslims have already reached that higher level of consciousness. We don't require any idols to concentrate. Furthermore, once the pundit told me that when we speak to children, 
we have to make them understand easily. If your child asks you, why does it thunder? So we give the reply that I macha ki pistiye. It is thundering because I macha ki pistiye. Grandmother in the heaven, she is grinding flour. I told him, in Islam, we don't agree in telling a lie, even if it's a white lie. If I tell my son that it thunders because I macha ki pistiye, and when he goes to school, he learns that thundering is due to sudden expansion of rapidly heated air, he will start thinking that my father is telling a lie. What we have to know, we have to speak the truth. The pundits and the scholars, they say that at the lower level, the idol is required for concentration. At the higher level, we don't require concentration. Like how if we study at the lower standard one, it is required, higher level is not required. I tell them that suppose we teach mathematics. In standard two, when we teach mathematics, we say 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. But the same 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 remains in 10th standard, remains when it does its graduation, it even remains when it does a PhD. The basic teaching of any subject remains the same. 2 plus 2 will remain the same irrespective of its second standard or 10th standard or graduation or PhD. It is very clear that in the Vedas, in the Hindu scriptures, Almighty God has got no images. It is the basics. You can't change your basic. If someone tells me that in standard 2, 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. So you can't tell your son, don't worry, when you reach standard 10, I will tell you 2 plus 2 is not equal to 5. You have to correct him immediately. So it's the duty of all the Hindu scholars to tell the Hindus that according to the Hindu scriptures, Almighty God has got no images. That is the basic. So even at the basic level, they should preach to their followers that idol worship is wrong. Hope that answers the question. The next question, which is the fourth question of the day and the first on the slip is by Brother Rohit Shah. He asks, if Islam is the religion of peace, then why does it preach the concept of jihad? That is... Uh, fighting and killing the kafir. In fact, Hinduism is the religion of peace. Dravada has asked a very important question that if Islam is the religion of peace, why does it preach about jihad, that is fighting and killing the kafir? In fact, Hinduism is the religion of peace. There is a great misconception as far as jihad in Islam is concerned. This misconception is not only among the non-Muslims, it even among the Muslim. They think that any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for personal gain, whether it be for fame, whether it be for money, any war fought by any Muslim is jihad. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim. Jihad comes from the Arabic word jihada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. In Islamic context, it means to strive against one's own evil inclination. It also means to strive to make the society better. It also means to strive in the battlefield in self-defense. It also means to fight against tyrant and oppression. Jihad basically means to strive, it means to struggle. And very often the critics of Islam, even the Hindu critics, even Arun Shuri, he writes in his book, The World of Fatwa, and he quotes, Surah Tawba chapter number 9 verse number 5 and it says that the Quran mentions wherever you find a kafir into bracket Hindus wherever you find a kafir you kill them and if you open the Quran and if you read in this Quran chapter number 9 verse number 5 it does say that wherever you find a kafir you kill him but it is a quotation out of context for the context read a few verses previous the first few verses of Surah Tawbah speaks about a peace treaty between the Muslims and the Mushriks of Makkah. This peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the Mushriks of Makkah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the time he reaches verse number 5, he gives the ultimatum to the enemies, to the Mushriks of Makkah. You put things straight in four months time, otherwise the declaration of war. And in the battlefield, Allah says to the Muslims, wherever you find the enemies, wherever you find the kafir, you kill them. This verse of the Quran is talking about the battlefield. When the Muslims are fighting for truth, against falsehood, against the enemy, if they come to attack you, don't get scared, kill them. Any army general to boost up the morale of the soldiers will say that kill the enemies. He will not say that let the enemies go. So Quran speaks the same. 
And Arun Shuri, after verse number 5 of Surah Toba, jumps to verse number 7. Any intelligent person knows that verse number 6 has the reply to his allegation. Verse number 6 says that if the enemies, if the mushriks want asylum, don't just let them go. Escort them to a place of security so that they will hear the word of Almighty God. The most generous army general today will say that let the enemy go. Which army general today will say that escort the enemy to security? That is what the Quran says. And there is another misconception in Islam that jihad means holy war. Holy war in Arabic is Harbu Muqaddasa. Nowhere in the Quran is Harbu Muqaddasa mentioned, nowhere it's mentioned in the Hadith. Holy war is not the translation of jihad. This holy war was first used to describe the crusaders, the Christian crusaders who conquered many lands and killed thousands of people in the name of Christianity. Now today they use this holy war for Muslims, which is totally wrong. And unfortunately many Muslim scholars in world commerce, even they use holy war as a translation of jihad, which is totally wrong. Let's analyze what do the Hindu scriptures have to speak about jihad. It's mentioned in Bhagavad Gita chapter number 2 verse number 50. Shri Krishna tells Arjun that strive for yoga. That's good for you. Strive. We struggle. So even Shri Krishna tells Arjun to strive and struggle. And if you read the Mahabharat, Mahabharat, Mahabharat speaks about a battle between the cousins, the Kaurav and the Pandavas. There are thousands of verses in Mahabharat which only speak about fighting, multiple times more than the Quran. And if you read Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita is holy scripture of the Hindus. It speaks about advice given by Sri Krishna to Arjun in the battlefield. Bhagavad Gita says in chapter number 1, verse number 42, verse number 46, Arjun says, I would prefer dying unarmed and without fighting rather than kill the cousins, the Kauravas, the son of distrust. Sri Krishna replies in the next chapter, chapter number 2, verse number 2, O Arjun, how could such impurities come to your mind that you don't want to fight? You will not enter heaven. How could you get such important thoughts which weakened your heart? Sri Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 2, verse number 31 to verse number 33, it says, O Arjun, you are a Kshatriya, you should fight. Then only will you go to heaven, otherwise you won't go. And blessed are those Kshatriyas who fight for the truth in the battle. And many of the critics, they speak against Quran and the Hadith. And they quote Sahih Bukhari, volume number 4, book of Jihad, chapter number 2, Hadith 46, in which a prophet said, Mujahid is the person who strives in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if a Mujahid dies, in the battlefield, he will go to Jannah, to paradise. And if he wins, he will get the booty of the war. Exactly same thing is mentioned by Sri Krishna. In Bhagavad Gita, chapter number 2, verse number 37. Oh Arjun, go and fight. If you get killed, you will go to heaven. And if you win the battle, you will enjoy the good of this world, this earthly world. Exactly same thing, what is mentioned in the hadith. Imagine if I quote saying that Bhagavad Gita says you should kill your cousins. It will be devilish on my part. I am telling out of context. It will be devilish. The right thing is Bhagavad Gita says that you have to fight for the truth against falsehood. And even if it be your cousin who on the falsehood, even if you have to kill them for the truth, there is no problem. So quoting out of context is devilish. So here we understand that if while speaking with the different types of people, we should know how to convince them. Believe me, hundreds of Hindus have spoken to me and saying jihad is wrong. The moment I say, but isn't it mentioned in Bhagavad Gita that you should kill the cousin? They tell me, no, but that is Sri Krishna is talking about fighting of truth against falsehood. I said, that is what the Quran says. Oh, if that is what the Quran says, then we... My name is Saira. I am a teacher. In your talk, you mentioned about pillars of Iman, that is faith in Islam and showed the similarities of it 
in hindu scriptures is there any mention of the pillars of islam in hinduism this is the question that i've mentioned about pillars of iman in my talk and compared with similarities in hindu scripture are there any similarities between pillars of islam and the hindu scriptures yes sister time didn't permit me to speak about all the similarities we can speak for days together as far as pillars of islam are concerned it's mentioned in sahih bukhari volume number 1 in the book of iman hadith number 8 the beloved prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that islam is based on five principles on five pillars the first is affirming la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah there is no god but allah and prophet muhammad peace be upon him the messenger of allah the second is establishing salah third is zakat charity fourth is som that is fast in the month of ramadan and fifth is pilgrimage to city of makka once in a lifetime these are basically five pillars the first one about one allah subhanahu wa taala and the final messenger muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam i have already discussed in my talk regarding the second pillar of salah the main point of salah the main portion of salah in islam is sujood that's prostration allah says in the quran in surah imran chapter number 3 verse number 43 ya maryam muknuti li rabbiki wasjudi that o mary worship thy love devotedly and bow down with those who bow down allah says in the quran in surah hajj chapter number 22 verse number 77 Ya ayyu alladhina amanu o you believe bow down and prostrate yourself and prostrate with those who prostrate so the major part is prostration in hinduism there are various types of worship one of the types of worship is called as sashtang sashtang means from sa meaning with aat meaning eight ang means part of body so sashtang means eight parts of the body that means when you worship you should touch eight parts of the body now if you analyze the best way a hindu can do sashtang is the sajood we do in salah the eight parts of the body we touch is the forehead is the nose is the two hands is the two knees and the two feet the third pillar of islam is zakat that's charity 2.5 percent of excess wealth in charity every year. Charity is even prescribed in the Quran in Surah Al Hashr, chapter 59, verse number 7. That charity has been prescribed so that the wealth does not circulate only among the rich. This is exactly what is mentioned in Rig Veda, book number 10, hymn number 117, verse number 5. That gives charity to the poor, and you may never know. Today you are rich, tomorrow you may become poor, and wealth circulates like the wheels of a chariot. Same thing as Islam. Pillar number four, Psalm. That means fasting for the complete lunar month of Ramadan. Abstain from food and drink from dawn to sunset. Hinduism has various types of fasting. One type of fasting mentioned in Manusmriti, chapter number six, verse number twenty-four, is fasting for one month. Fasting is further mentioned in Manusmriti, chapter number four. Verse number two twenty two and Manusmriti chapter number eleven, verse number two hundred and four. The fifth pillar is Hajj. That every adult Muslim who has the means to perform Hajj should at least perform Hajj. That is pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca in the month of Hajj. There are various types of pilgrimage in Hinduism. One type is mentioned in Rig Veda, book number three, hymn number twenty nine. Verse number four. It speaks about Elaispad, a tirtha, a place of worship called as Elaispad. Ela means Allah, Spad means place. So Elaispad means a place of God, and it says it is in the center of Prithvi, Earth, and we know that Makka is the center of the world. So Veda says one place of pilgrimage is the house of Allah. We call it Baitullah, which is the center of the Earth. And further, if you read in Rig Veda, book number three, hymn number twenty-nine, verse number eleven, it speaks about Nara Shamsa, about Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this place of pilgrimage is nothing but Mecca. And if you open and read the Sanskrit dictionary, it says Elaspad means a place of God, a place of Tirtha. Mecca pilgrimage is also mentioned in Rig Veda, book number one, hymn number one twenty-eight, verse number one. These were, in short, the similarities between Hinduism and the pillars of Islam. Yes brother
Samir Khatib, I am in business. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has been prophes prophesied in 4,000 old scriptures of Hinduism, Vedas and uh, the uh, uh, Puranas. Therefore, Dr. Zakir Naik, you believe that these books are God sent. And therefore, Hindus are also Ahl -e Kitab. The brother asked a very good question that since Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has prophesied in the Vedas and the other Hindu scriptures, can we consider these scriptures to be the word of God? And can we call them Ahl -e Kitab? But the Ahl -e Kitab, as I mentioned in my talk, it's a word used for people of the book, specifically referring to the Jews and Christians. Ahl -e Kitab refers to Jews and Christians. Regarding your question, that can we consider Vedas or the other Hindu scriptures the word of God? Allah says in the Quran in Surah Rath, chapter number 13, verse number 38, In every age have we sent a revelation, but by name only four revelations are mentioned in the Quran. Torah, Zabur, Injil and the Quran. Torah is the wahi which was revealed to Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the wahi which was revealed to Prophet David, peace be upon him. Injil is the wahi which was revealed to Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. And Quran is the last and final revelation revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, all these revelations that were revealed, they were revealed only for those people and that time. All revelations before the Quran were revealed for those people and that time. Quran was revealed for the whole of humankind. Your question, can we consider Veda or the Hindu scripture with the word of God? Since the Vedas are not mentioned by him in the Quran, we cannot say for sure that they were the word of God. What we can say, maybe they were the word of God. You ask me, since Allah has sent various messengers, can we consider Ram or Lakshman as the messenger of God? See, Allah says, He has sent several revelations on the face of the earth. He has sent several messengers. Since Veda is not mentioned in the Quran to be the word of God, I can say maybe the word of God. I cannot say for sure. Similarly, neither can I say that Ram or Krishna are the messengers of God. I can say maybe they were. Since they are not mentioned by name, I cannot say that for sure they were. Maybe. But even if Ram was a messenger of God, even if Krishna was a messenger of God, even if Veda was the word of God, they were meant for those people and for that time. Today, whichever part of the world you are living in, you should follow the last and final revelation that the glorious Quran and the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which is even mentioned in Hindu scriptures as Ante Mautar. The next question from the slip is uh, Brother Amar Sinha. He has asked, you promote interfaith dialogues. In this, do you agree with those who say all the religions are same? Brother asked the question that since I promote interfaith dialogue, do I agree with those people who say that all religions are same? There are various interfaith dialogues going on throughout the world, even in Bombay and we find that religious personalities of various religions come on the stage and say all religions are the same. A Hindu personality comes, a religious leader and says all religions are the same. A Muslim personality comes and says all religions are the same. A Christian personality comes and says all religions are the same. I ask them a simple question. That if you agree all religions are the same, then will a Christian priest give up Christianity and will he become a Muslim? Will a Muslim person give up Islam and will he become a Hindu? Will a Hindu priest give up Hinduism and will he become a Christian? The answer is no. These people, they try and portray an image of being secular. They scratch each other's back. It's like a student asking a teacher that 2 plus 2 is equal to how much? Is 2 plus 2 is equal to 3? Or is it equal to 4? Or is it equal to 5? Three teachers come on the stage and say, all three answers are correct. 2 plus 2 is equal to 3 also, 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 also, and 2 plus 2 is equal to 5 also. This is nothing but garbage. I being a student of Islam and compiled religion, I have read the various scriptures. I know the practices of the various religions are not the same. I believe in communal harmony. I believe in interfaith dialogue. What I say, if we make an assumption, that let's assume that at least amongst all the various scriptures, various religions, at least one 
scripture is 100% authentic the word of god now this assumption no religious personality would object to i would not mind accepting at least one of the religious scripture has been the word of god the christian would say fine at least one means at least bible is the word of god the hindu will say no problem at least the vedas is the word of god the muslim will say no problem at least quran is the word of god now what you do you collect all the hundreds of teachings from the christian bible from the hindu scripture the veda and from islam the quran now you find the commonalities suppose 50 are common now when we take out 50 commonalities the teachings from all these religious scriptures everyone will at least agree that this portion of the various scriptures at least is surely the word of god and no one would object implementing it because it is present in all the scriptures this technique of communal harmony is based on the quranic verse of surah imran chapter 3 verse 64 which says ta'ala wala kalmatin sawa in bayna baynakum come to common terms as we have you there may be other differences there may be other differences in the religions i can give a talk even on differences between islam and hinduism but since there come one commonalities no one would object on following the commonalities because it is present in all the religious scripture there may be some people who may not be well versed of the scripture they may sometimes be offended for example you point out that all the religious scripture whether the bible whether the veda whether the quran says you should not do idol worship now since he is not aware of the vedas he may feel offended but yet he will not go against me because if he goes against me he is going against the veda which is considered the word of god so this is the best way for interfaith dialogue and communal harmony that come to common terms as between us and you hope that answers the question yes uh, brother uh, my name is mubin solkar and i am a lawyer by profession uh, before i put in my question i must say sir that i am really impressed by your knowledge of hindu scriptures it's really amazing my question to you is that you said that there are so many similarities between islam and hinduism does that mean that according to islam a person can be a hindu the brother asked a very critical question that since i pointed so many similarities between islam and hinduism does it mean that according to islam a person can be a hindu brother if by the term hindu you mean a geographical definition a person who lives in india then according to islam there is no problem in a person being indian i am a indian and i am a practicing muslim i am proud of my country india and i am proud to be a muslim so no problem in islam if you are a indian and practicing islam but if you mean by the term hindu a person who follow the religious scriptures of hinduism then i have got no objection as long as that hindu strictly follows the established truths of the scriptures of hinduism what do i mean by established truths established truth means those truths mentioned in the hindu scriptures which have been reconfirmed by the last and final revelation of god that the glorious quran and i'm referring to vedas and the quran which i talked in my lecture both of them they believe that there is one god they believe in the messengers they believe the last messenger prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam they believe in the hereafter if they believe in all these established facts i've got no objection but if you tell me no a hindu is a person who believes in everything what is mentioned in the scriptures then i being a student of compared religion i don't agree why it's not possible for a hindu to believe in all the teachings in the hindu scriptures because many a time the teachings of different scriptures of hinduism they contradict many a time the same scriptures rigved they contradict themselves manusmrit they contradict themselves for example one place it says that you should not have pope one place it says that you should have pope so person cannot follow contradicting statements simultaneously so what we have to realize that even in the hindu scripture certain things with the unethical as spoken by the great reformers they believe in caste system which raja ram mohan roy justice rand spoke against they spoke again the sati system that the wife should burn in the funeral pyre of the husband so these thing a person cannot follow that's the reason i say that as long as the hindu follows the established fact and also agrees that there is one last rishi antim rishi when buddha came and he tried to purify hinduism of the superstition many people went against him and how come he is coming to purify 
the Vedas. Later on they agreed that he was the 23rd of the 24 avatars. They even agree that he was the 9th avatar of Vishnu. Similarly, when you read the scripture, it talks about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the 24th avatar. He is the 10th avatar of Vishnu. He is the Antim Rishi. So if the Hindu believes in the established facts, believes in Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the messenger of God, believes in one God, believes in the hereafter, there is no problem in him being a Hindu. Just a minute as I close the program. Though Dr. Zakir would love to answer questions, I think for another one, two, three, four hours, the rules here do not permit us to continue. I have got a final ultimatum to close the program. If you have any further questions on the topic or on Islam or on comparative religion, you are most welcome to get in touch with the IRF or attend our lectures followed by open question and answer sessions which we have after any kind of lecture on Saturday at 4 p.m. every Sunday at 10.30 p.m. for gents and on Monday for ladies at 3 p.m. Those who have not filled up the guest registration slip are kindly requested to do so at the registration counter while leaving so that you can be in touch and we may be able to inform you of our program. Lastly, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making this program possible. On behalf of the IRF and our organizing committees, I thank all our guests, the press and all the professionals who are involved in the running of this program as well as our staff and volunteers and all persons who have helped up in making this program successful, especially with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum. Such type of lectures as Dr. Zaki Naik has convinced you, hundred percent people are convinced. It was very nice program, such programs must be conducted more and more. That is very uh, nice. Ajay Vaidya. I जिस बोलते हैं ना राह मंजिल का एक चिराग बन जाएगा स्पीकर छान बोलले सर्व भाषा अशी स्पष्ट होती काय केले तो तो आणि समजत होतो एंड माय हंबल रिक्वेस्ट इज दैट टू मिस्टर डॉक्टर जाकिर नाईक इज दैट कम एंड प्रीच इन द स्लम एरिया आल्सो आई 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 सिंपली प्रे टू गॉड टू ऑलमाइटी गॉड दैट अ पर्सन ऑफ हिज कैलिबर इफ ओनली 5% ऑफ पर्सन इन दिस अर्थ आर ऑफ हिज कैलिबर आई थिंक देयर विल बी नो प्रॉब्लम इन द वर्ल्ड